come to the new police headquarters, um, whereas you all might have heard, Andrea Hutchison, a 30-year-old a 30 year old young black man, was killed on April 1st, and the, and, um, wow. the family is grieving, um, you know, by the Durham Police Department, um, and there's been um, a, a very little response from the Durham Police Department trying to say that he blame, you know, again, blaming him as if he should be shot and killed um, for what happened. Um, and so, um, you know, DeAndre Ballard's uncle, you know, Miguel Staten, of course, DeAndre Ballard was a, uh, an Eagle, a central student killed by um, security mm-hmm. guards at his, at his uh, you know, at his, at his uh, apartment complex um, and still has had no justice. That security guard that killed him like a vigilante was not a sworn officer and has never has not been arrested. He killed him in cold blood and has not been arrested. There's been no justice for DeAndre Ballard. So Miguel, his uncle, will be speaking, um, and there's many other powerful uh, uh, organizations. You know, the Fight for 15, which uh, has exposed the epidemic of sexual harassment that women workers face. They say in low-wage work that 70% of women face sexual harassment on the job. Wow. 70% of women are low-wage workers. I mean, it's always the most oppressed, the the lowest-paid that you have the worst conditions. And, and these bosses, these arrogant bosses, think they can get away with this harassment. So in, in, in Durham, there was, uh, there's a chain of McDonald's. There's the one over on, on, on Hillsborough Road. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's owned by the same owner as the one on the, the Morgan Street downtown loop. It's the same owner, uh, a notorious franchise. It's disgusting. Um, and there has been five women that have been sexually harassed. Um, and so they have been speaking out. And, and they're going to be speaking out about no more sexual harassment, joining the Me Too movement. The hashtag Me Too McDonald's is one of the slogans they're raising up. And uh, we're going to be at that. We're going to close our, our march and rally, end it at the McDonald's, actually, on the Morgan Street Loop. Um, and so uh, it's going to be a powerful evening in Durham after we go to Raleigh that day. Um, you know, definitely check out uh, the Durham Association of Educators website and go down to Raleigh from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. on that May 1st at the state legislature. It can be a powerful, powerful day. Last year there was 19,000 teachers and their supporters. This year there's probably going to be more. Um, it's going to be very powerful rally and protest. And then that evening from 5:30 to 8:30 we'll be rallying here in Durham, uh, and it's organized by the Durham Workers Assembly. Uh, on any of the uh, uh, social media at Durham Workers, uh, Instagram, Facebook. Um, uh, uh, Twitter at Durham Workers. Just look up the Durham Workers Assembly. Uh, we're out there. We're doing big things. We have monthly workers assemblies where workers speak out the first Thursday every month, speak in bitterness about what these bosses are doing to them on the job, um, and organizing and fighting back from the bakeries to the fast food restaurants to the home health care workers to the city workers. Uh, there's just so many workers, and it's a powerful movement we're trying to build with this Durham Workers Assembly. You know, one of our slogans is. Durham is going to be a union town. Durham is a union town. So, um, you, you know, you can go to unionsfordurham.org. There's a lot of information about our campaigns on there, but we're really trying to raise a ruckus, and um, there's just so much uh, uh, that we could talk about. Um, oh, yeah. So, yeah. There's so much going on, because I know you were even involved with uh, some of the stuff that was going on, even with ICE and everything, when that gentleman had gone to a sanctuary church, and uh, as far as I know, he's still – back uh, deported in the other land, even though his family would like him back here and everything. I cannot think of the gentleman's name, but I know you know who I'm talking about. He's the one that was in the uh, church and everything. So I know that you were involved in that. But what do you think are some of the things that uh, when folks find out that you are such an activist and so involved in activism and everything, what are some of the misconceptions that you as an activist have to face? Because I'm sure there's some misconceptions that just people in general have about what it means to be an activist and what the kind of work that you do is all about. So if you had to talk to some, when you talk to some of the folks that, that don't really understand necessarily what activism is about, what are some of the misconceptions that you have to fight against? I'm sure that like when you go to the churches and some of the other parts of society, there might be some misconceptions that people have about the activism world. So I'm just wondering what are some of the things that you've had to face as part of the misconceptions that you would like to folks to understand that that's not really what it's all about and understand more of what it is. That's a really excellent question, Mark. I really appreciate that. I mean, I think one of the big things we, we were speaking about a little earlier um, on this program, y'all are, y'all are talking about it, is that um, when, when we talk about organizing for justice and we talk about Black Lives Matter, we talk about $15 an hour, this is not a Republican or a Democratic issue. 
So, so, and a lot of people are frustrated with the Democrats, and I am too, and they got a right to be, right? Um, you know, uh, sometimes we got to hold our nose and vote for them, but, um, you know, and, and deal with that, which we got to deal with. But, you know, but meanwhile, we got to build power. So we, we, we got to let people know there is, just because you're out there and you're not a Republican doesn't mean you got to be a Democrat. You can be an independent. You can, you can build organization that ha- we have, we have no permanent allies. We have permanent interests. Right. That's what that's what, you know, I, you know, that slogan, you know, has been raised in the movement. Right. Um, and we, as 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 working class people, as oppressed people, we have interests. We don't have, uh, uh, you know, we have to realize that our our, our struggles and our issues uh, that we see every day, um, you know, may not always you know, align with a particular political uh, entity or party, but that we have to build our own grassroots, really grassroots organization in our churches, in our communities, in our workplaces. I mean, the other big misconception is that we're just – that we're angry or that we got violent or that or if you come to a – that if you're involved in an organization that, that you've got to go to a protest and that, and that you're going to get – that the, the cops are going to beat your head and you're going to get arrested. And that is the farthest from the truth. I mean, we – you know, we – in the organizing I do with, with city workers and in my job with state mental health workers, most of what we do is, is just is, – is meet up after work and, and organize and try to identify – what are some of the things that we can unite our coworkers on, our, our community around? And, and that doesn't mean you always got to be out there on the front lines, you know, um, getting your head knocked by the cops. Um, you know, that's, that, that's a sensationalist media that, that paints that picture, right? The work that we do, the deep work to build community, uh, to, to support each other. When, 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 you know, my sister Sandra Moss, who lost her job, you know, uh, because of, a, uh, you know, some, a racist fire and said, literally this boss of a Central Regional Hospital in Butner said, you know, uh, 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 you know, you were laughing at this patient and, and you said he smelled like chicken. Um, you know, uh, and this, so this is the most racist, you know, thing they said to her. And so when she lost her job, she almost got evicted from her house and almost got, almost lost her car. So we, you know, we, we circled up and raised her enough funds to keep her in her house, to pay her, 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 her car note and her, and her rent. And, 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 and that's the kind of stuff that you don't see right on the news. You know, we take care of our people. When you're part of organization, when you're building grassroots, there is mutual aid. There is real love in, in the organization. And a lot of that stuff doesn't get reported enough or doesn't get shared. But we have to, we have to self-organize because if we're out there on our own, um, you know, by ourselves, this society will make you feel like you are a horrible person and make you feel like it's your fault. It is not your fault. If you're getting evicted, it's not your fault. If you lost your job, it's probably not your fault, right? If, if, right. if you got beat up or even killed by the police, it probably isn't your fault, right? But the system and the newspapers and the mainstream media wants you to believe that, right? And so we have to break that down, that, that we recognize that people, uh, you know, have real needs uh, and we have to meet them. And sometimes those needs are public and in a demonstration we're fighting for the masses and, and we're raising that up. But sometimes it's just about building those bonds and, and building and holding each other in those hard moments. And so, uh, uh, so there's a lot of tenderness, right, to it that I think people don't see. I think So I think those are some of the misconceptions I would, I would lay out there. Yeah, and I think another thing that happens sometimes is that uh, sometimes people get misconce- misconceptions about that if you're on one side of um, – the aisle or another, and when I say the aisle, I don't mean Democrats or Republicans. I talk about left or right. That that sometimes there's not comp- that there can sometimes be common interests. I know that even where I work at at a measurement, not not at Haytap, but the, the other job, there are some people there that are definitely some staunch conservatives. But sometimes when you talk to them about some of the issues that are pressing to them, some of those issues are actually very similar. Like I know some of them are just as concerned about um, making sure that their money is the same, that their rent is a, a fair rent and some of the things that you just talked about, like even with gentrification, that they're, you know, living in an affordable either apartment or that the house note is something that is affordable. So yeah, while we call folks and maybe uh, left and right and everything, some of the issues I think are very much uh, similar. I mean, there may be some other things that we will never agree on, but there are some things that I think you can find common ground with, even with people that might be a little bit farther from you on the right side of the spectrum than those of us that are on the left side of the spectrum. Yeah, yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, I think, again, it's about interests, right? I mean, people say left right. and right, um, you know, and it's like the Democrats and Republicans are like an inch from each other. I mean, I'm talking about what is the real left, right? The real left 
says that we have some basic fundamental human rights, right? You know, we got a human right to have to health care. Nobody should not have right. health care in this country, right? There's no excuse. You know, we, we, we got a right. Everyone should have the right to a job. Everyone should be right. guaranteed an income or a job. Everyone should have housing, right? As rich as this country is and as much abandoned spaces, you know how many abandoned buildings and condos and, and all these, you know, things that not, not just new things are building, but old things that are just abandoned that people can just move into. But we're so obsessed with, with private property because we uphold these property rights more than these basic human rights. And so, right. you know, and this is a lot of what, you know, W.E. Du Bois and, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know Langston Hughes and, you know, these, these folks were appealing to the United Nations right back in the day uh, about the human rights of black people. Um, you know, uh, you know, now dealing you know, with like the human rights of, 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 of black people still, the human rights of, of migrants, the human rights of women, the human rights of Muslims, of workers. We all have, you know, of, of lesbian, gay, and bi, and transgender people. We have fundamental human rights. And no matter what your identity, what your race, you should have this. And as rich as we are in this country, there's no reason. Oh, there is a reason because, because those – I just read something today. I was reading, there was this piece called An Ode to a Sanitation Worker, a beautiful piece I saw in Jacobin. I don't like Jacobin magazine that much, but and it was talking about that Jeff Bezos, you know, the owner of Amazon, he makes more money in four minutes, in four minutes, than the average sanitation worker makes in an entire year. Right? Wow. There's something wrong with that. What value does he give to the world by having Amazon like that, there's no social value in that, you know. He, it's, he, it's super exploitation. It, it, these workers, I see these brothers coming running, running around my neighborhood trying to deliver these, these packages and stressed out in these like unmarked vehicles and trying to drop them off. They ain't getting paid pennies. He go to the warehouses and these workers are running around with these little checkers on their arms and just like stressed out, and 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 and, and they have this brilliant scheme of workers snitching on each other and telling that the way you get raises and promotions is by how many people you snitch on. I mean, it's just that's the reason they haven't got a union in there yet. The conditions are horrible, right? But it's because, you know, these bosses are organized. When I talk about, you know, we got to organize, the bosses and the owners, they have meetings and boardrooms and their own forms of unions, these chambers of commerce and everything else, and they are highly organized. They meet and they have a plan. We have to meet and have a plan also, or we're going to always get run over and get the short end of the stick, if we even get any of the stick at all anymore, right? Yeah, because one, um, one, one of the big things that's really interesting that you just brought up when you talked about Amazon is I know that the taxi workers are not exactly thrilled with Uber, and part of the reason they're not thrilled with Uber is because, if I understand it, it's from my few times I've had to catch a taxi to one place or another. The taxi drivers are actually unionized, but Uber and some of these newer things like Lyft and everything, and I've actually got friends that drive for those. They are not unionized, and they, so they run into all kinds of problems because of not being unionized. Absolutely. No, when you're unionized, when you're on the job, when you force your boss to negotiate with you through a collective bargain agreement, or even if you don't get a collective bargaining agreement, you have real power. The bosses know that they all wealth is created because of workers, because of your labor as a worker. That boss would not earn, Jeff Bezos would not earn a penny if it wasn't for the millions of Amazon workers that work for him, right? And they know that. The bosses are class conscious. Sometimes we as the workers are not as class conscious as the boss. They are very class conscious, and they're trying to hold on to that. And so, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and when we are organized on our job, when we're unionized, when we have that power, there's a lot of demonization about what a union is. A union is just you on the job having an organization. You don't have to join a national union, you know, although, you know, a lot of people do. You know, I'm, I'm part of an independent union, the UE, United Electrical Workers. But, you know, uh, you have power, right? And, but you don't have power as an individual. We have power as an organization of making plans and making demands collectively on the boss, withholding our labor. Their, their, their biggest fear is when we don't come to work, Right. Um, and so they do everything they can to keep us in place, to give us just enough to keep us working, to keep us moving, um, to keep us able to be replaced. Um, but the, the tide is turning. Like I said, 2018, there was more worker organization and strikes than there had been in decades before. Uh, 2019 is going to be even bigger and better. Um, with the largest manufacturing strike since Trump was elected, was up in Erie, Pennsylvania, at a locomotive factory in our, our proud union, UE, um, you know, teachers, you know, you're going to see, you know, probably tens of thousands of teachers uh, on May 1st in, in North Carolina going out on a personal day. Um, and so 
but that's because they're organized on their job. They're highly organized. The teachers get what they want.